It might seem logical to assume that only adults are capable of committing heinous crimes. However, children can be equally capable of acts that shock and horrify, from a young killer mocking a victim's family in court to a murderous couple bragging about their latest crime on YouTube to siblings slaughtering family members for internet fame. These are some of the most terrifying young criminals in American prisons, T.J. Lane. First on the list is T.J. Lane, a killer whose innocent appearance hides the true monster beneath. On February 27, 2012, the small town of Chardon, Ohio, was plunged into tragedy when T.J. Lane opened fire at Chardon High School, leaving the community reeling. Lane, a 17-year-old student at the Alternative Lake Academy, entered the Chardon High School cafeteria that morning wearing a sweatshirt with the word killer written on it and armed with a .22 caliber handgun. Without saying a word, Lane opened fire targeting a table of students gathered before classes began. Within moments, three students, Daniel Parmertor, 16, Demetrius Hewlin, 16, and Russell King Jr., 17, were fatally wounded. Three other students were injured, one of whom was left permanently paralyzed. Lane was not a stranger to Chardon High School, having attended the school before transferring to the alternative education program. The motive behind his violent actions remained largely unclear, although some reports suggested he felt victimized or ostracized. The response to the shooting was swift. A teacher chased Lane out of the school, and authorities later apprehended him near his car, parked about a mile from the scene. Subsequent investigations revealed that Lane had stolen the handgun used in the shooting from his uncle. During his trial, Lane's behavior was disturbingly defiant and disruptive. He appeared in court wearing a shirt with the word killer written on it, which he had inscribed himself. Lane smirked, made obscene gestures at the victim's families, and showed no remorse for his actions. In March 2013, Lane was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. However, on September 11, 2014, Lane escaped alongside two other inmates from the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. This incident was especially alarming given Lane's criminal history. For hours, he remained at large, with authorities unable to locate him. He was ultimately recaptured six hours later. In March 2016, amidst heightened security concerns, Lane was transferred to the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville, a maximum security prison designed to house the most dangerous inmates. One of Lane's friends spoke to CNN, describing him as just an ordinary teenager and expressed complete shock at his actions. She noted that while Lane often appeared sad, his behavior seemed otherwise normal. Another friend shared insights into Lane's school life, revealing that he had been regularly bullied by peers. This bullying had pushed Lane to build an emotional wall making him reluctant to share personal details or open up about his experiences. These accounts raise an important question. Can the challenges Lane faced at home and the bullying he endured at school justify his actions? Alyssa Bustamante In a chilling case that shocked the nation, Alyssa Bustamante, a 15-year-old from Missouri, became infamously known as the Thrill Killer Teen. Her horrific crime involved the deliberate murder of her nine-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Olton. Alyssa Bustamante appeared to be a typical teenage girl, but her online presence revealed a much darker side. This hidden darkness erupted on October 21, 2009, when Bustamante lured Elizabeth into the woods. There, she strangled the young girl, slit her throat, and stabbed her chest with a kitchen knife. After the murder, Bustamante buried Elizabeth's body in a shallow grave she had dug with her hands behind their home. This brutal act seemed to be a realization of Bustamante's disturbing fantasies. Her public profiles on MySpace and YouTube chillingly listed killing people and cutting as hobbies. One of her posts read, Now, I gotta go to church, Lewell. On the evening of October 21, 2009, after Patty Price reported her daughter Elizabeth missing, police launched an urgent search. Investigators were soon led to Alyssa Bustamante's home. Interviews with her family and the discovery of her diary, containing incriminating details, pointed to her involvement. 
When confronted with diary entries describing her desire to kill, Bustamante confessed to the crime, providing further horrifying insights into her motives. During an intense interrogation, Alyssa Bustamante was pressured to confess to the crime. At first, she tried to feign innocence, but the police informed her that they had found her diary. When pressed further and with no place to retreat, Alyssa admitted to the murder. Initially, she claimed it was an accident, but the story quickly unraveled when she confessed to digging the grave five days before Elizabeth's death. Investigators pointed out that an autopsy would reveal exactly how Elizabeth had died, leading Alyssa to admit to the full extent of her actions. At her trial in 2012, Alyssa Bustamante, who was tried as an adult despite her troubled childhood, pled guilty to second-degree murder to avoid a life sentence without parole. This plea allowed for the possibility of parole after 30 years. However, an additional conviction for armed criminal action meant that even if she became eligible for parole in 2024, she faced another 30 years in prison, making the earliest possible release date 2054, when she would be 60 years old. Lionel Tate The next child killer is Lionel Tate. Two children were left alone to play, and the day ended with a six-year-old girl dead. Was this just a case of children's play gone wrong, or was there something more sinister at work? On July 28, 1999, in Broward County, Florida, 12-year-old Lionel Tate was left alone with his six-year-old cousin, Tiffany Eunuch. That day ended tragically marking an event that would make Tate the youngest American sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That evening, while Kathleen Grosset Tate rested upstairs, she left Tiffany Eunuch in the care of her son, Lionel. Shortly after, Tate alerted his mother that Tiffany wasn't breathing. Investigations later revealed that Tiffany had suffered severe bruising and injuries resembling those of a car crash, including a fractured skull broken ribs, and internal bleeding. Tate claimed the injuries occurred while he was imitating wrestling moves. During the trial, Tate's defense argued that Tiffany's death was a tragic accident, pointing out that the 12-year-old, who weighed 170 pounds, was simply trying to emulate wrestling moves from TV with Tiffany, who weighed only 48 pounds. However, this argument failed to sway the jury. In January 2001, at just 13 years old, Tate was convicted of first-degree murder. Under Florida law, first-degree murder did not require the jury to believe that Tate intended to harm. The law stipulated that committing an act likely to cause injury to a child that results in death constituted child abuse, and warranted a felony murder charge. During sentencing, Judge Joel Lazarus explained that the law applied even without proving Tate's intent to kill or understanding of the potential harm. He went on to say that the decision wasn't entirely his, and as a result, Tate was sentenced to life in prison without the need for the prosecution to prove intent or knowledge of his actions' deadly consequences. Unsurprisingly, the sentence sparked widespread controversy given that Tate was only 12 years old at the time of the crime, and his victim was just six. Ultimately, in 2008-2004, an appellate court overturned Tate's life sentence, citing that his mental competency had not been properly evaluated before the trial. He was released from prison under a plea agreement in January 2004, which included a guilty plea to second-degree murder, one year of a house arrest, and 10 years of probation. However, Tate's legal troubles didn't end there. In 2005, he faced charges of armed robbery, and a probation violation in 2006 sent him back to prison. On February 19, 2008, Lionel Tate pled no contest to robbery charges and was sentenced to 10 years in state prison. This sentence was to be served concurrently with a 30-year sentence for violating his probation. Tate is currently serving his time at the Charlotte Correctional Institution. The Bever Brothers, known as one of the most gruesome crimes in Broken Arrow, this case is often referred to as the Bever Family Massacre. What I'm about to share with you will send chills down your spine. For the Bever Brothers, the pursuit of fame was the driving force behind their insane actions. Investigator Rihanna Russell, who interviewed the younger brother, Michael, said, they wanted to kill at least 50 people, 
They wanted to. They wanted to become famous. They wanted a Wikipedia page and media coverage. Unfortunately, the tragic series of events began on the evening of July 22, 2015, in their home in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Robert, 18, and Michael Bever, 16, had secretly gathered a collection of knives, which they used to attack their family members. The horrifying ordeal began when Michael lured his sister into a bedroom under the pretense of showing her something on the computer. He then ambushed her, severely injuring her by slitting her throat and stabbing her multiple times. This disturbance alerted their mother, April, 44, who was brutally attacked by Robert. She sustained at least 48 stab wounds during the assault and died instantly. The brothers continued their violent rampage, moving from room to room. Their father, David Bever, 52, was stabbed 28 times and suffered numerous blunt force injuries. Their youngest brother, Christopher, only seven years old, was stabbed six times. The brothers then attacked their 18-year-old sister, Victoria, stabbing her 18 times in the neck, chest, back, and upper arms. Amid the bloody chaos, 12-year-old Daniel managed to lock himself in a room and call 911 for help. However, Michael tricked him into opening the door by pretending to be a victim himself. Once inside, the brothers stabbed Daniel nine times. Daniel's quick thinking and call for help played a critical role in saving his two sisters, two-year-old Autumn and 13-year-old Crystal. When the police arrived swiftly at the scene, the brothers fled through the back of the house but were soon located by a police K-9 unit in a nearby wooded area. Crystal Bever, one of the survivors of the Bever family massacre, identified her older brothers, Robert and Michael, as the perpetrators of the crime. This led to five charges of first-degree murder and one charge of assault with intent to kill. Both pleaded not guilty. In 2016 and 2018, Robert and Michael Bever were convicted on all charges related to the Bever family massacre. They were sentenced to multiple life terms. Robert was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, while Michael, due to his younger age, although his release is highly unlikely. Heaven Lee Arroyo Now, let's look at the case of a 15-year-old girl who brutally ended the life of Ana Vasquez Rodriguez in a savage attack. Arroyo, who had recently moved into her great-uncle's house on Johnson Street, lived there with Ana Vasquez Rodriguez and Ana's grandson. The home, already fraught with tension, became the site of a violent crime on October 6, 2019. Arroyo's great-uncle had planned a trip to New York to secure legal documents but was delayed due to car troubles. This delay frustrated Arroyo who became increasingly agitated throughout the day. As her impatience grew, she grabbed a pair of scissors from the kitchen and entered Ana Vasquez Rodriguez's bedroom, launching a brutal attack. She stabbed the bedridden 68-year-old woman 70 times. At the time of the horrific act, the only other person in the house was Ana's grandson, who was playing a video game with headphones on, entirely unaware of the tragedy unfolding. After the murder, Arroyo showered, discarded her blood-stained clothes in a nearby dumpster, and calmly informed Anna's grandson that his grandmother wasn't feeling well. Upon discovering the grim truth, the grandson immediately called 911. Police quickly arrived at the scene. The breakthrough in the investigation came when surveillance footage provided by the Fall River Housing Authority showed Arroyo discarding her clothes, contradicting her initial claim that she had been outside walking the dog and saw a masked man fleeing the scene. Once in custody, Arroyo's demeanor shifted, and she made several incriminating statements spontaneously. In Fall River Superior Court, she stood smiling and flipping her hair as she faced murder charges. When her name was called in court, the teenager stunned everyone with her reaction. In 2023, Arroyo, now 18 years old, pled guilty to second-degree murder in Fall River Superior Court. Judge René Dupuis sentenced her to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 19 years. Roxana Sikorsky In a case that shook the suburban community of Plymouth, Michigan, Roxana Sikorsky, 15, and her boyfriend faced serious charges for conspiring to kill their families. Roxana's story is a tragic one, beginning when she was adopted from Poland at the age of four, along with her siblings by the Sikorsky family. Early abuse led to a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder, a condition that made forming emotional bonds with her caretakers difficult. By age 15, in October 2014, Roxana's life took a dark turn under the influence of her boyfriend, 
Michael Rivera, 23. Rivera, who was much older than Roxana, manipulated her and plotted the murder of her family members who opposed their relationship. He even sent detailed instructions on how to carry out the killings, including a medical diagram to ensure they targeted vital areas. That night, Roxana attacked her younger brother with a knife, aiming for his neck, but thankfully, he survived. Shrieks from her sister alerted their parents, prompting Roxana to flee the scene through a window. She met with Rivera and hid in southwest Detroit. Police soon located them. Due to the deliberate nature of her actions, prosecutors charged Roxana as an adult. In March 2016, she was sentenced to 10 to 20 years for conspiracy to commit murder, while Rivera was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2015. Roxana's father was shocked by the court's decision, believing she wasn't capable of intending harm. Her mother, Lauren Sikorsky, expressed sorrow, stating that Roxana desperately needed ongoing mental health assistance. She feared that being incarcerated with adults would only worsen her fragile state. Roxana also shared her side of the story. Eric Smith. This is the case that dominated national headlines in the United States. It's okay, Mom. I'll go by myself. These were the last words Doreen Ruby heard from her son, Derek Ruby who was just four years old. Let's take a closer look at this notorious case. On a seemingly ordinary summer day, on August 2nd, 1993, the Peace of Savona, New York, was shattered by a horrific act of violence. Eric Smith, a 13-year-old boy, encountered Derek Ruby, a four-year-old, who was on his way to a local summer camp. In a sinister twist, Smith lured the young boy into a secluded wooded area under the guise of showing him a shortcut. There, he mercilessly ended Derek's life by strangling him until unconsciousness, then crushing his skull with a large rock. Smith later used a Kool-Aid pouch from Ruby's lunchbox to pour into the boy's open wounds. On that fateful day, as Doreen Ruby arrived at the park to pick up Derek, she discovered he hadn't arrived at the camp. Hours later, investigators discovered Derek's body in the woods just yards from the park. As the perpetrator remained free, fear gripped the community of Savona, with residents concerned for the safety of their children. By August 2nd, Smith confessed to his mother, who was consumed by guilt, that he had killed Derek. The Smith family alerted the police, and Eric was tried. It may seem logical to assume that only adults are capable of committing heinous crimes. However, children can be just as capable of acts that shock and terrify. From a young killer mocking a victim's family in court, to a murderous couple bragging about their latest crime on YouTube, to siblings slaughtering family members for internet fame, leading to isolation. After confessing, Eric was convicted of second-degree murder on November 7, 1994, at age 14. He received the harshest sentence available for juvenile offenders at the time, life imprisonment, with the possibility of parole after nine years. Eric Smith spent nearly three decades behind bars. Throughout his time in prison, he was repeatedly denied parole, with the parole board expressing concerns about his release. Over the years, Smith participated in several rehabilitation programs and consistently expressed remorse for his actions. In 2021, after multiple parole hearings, Eric Smith was finally granted parole and released from prison. Joshua Phillips. This is the case of Joshua Phillips, who entered prison as a child in 1999 at age 15 and is now a grown man. His crime, first-degree murder, resulted from killing eight-year-old Maddie Clifton on November 3, 1998, in the lakeside neighborhood of Jacksonville, Florida. Maddie Clifton had been reported missing by her mother, who became frantic when her daughter failed to return from playing outside. A massive search effort ensued, involving over 400 volunteers who scoured the area relentlessly. Joshua Phillips, who also participated in the search, was part of the local community. But on November 2nd, Phillips' mother noticed a wet spot on the carpet in his room. Upon further investigation, they discovered Maddie's body hidden under his bed. Shocked, Phillips' mother alerted the authorities, leading to his arrest at school hours later. Details of Maddie's murder are disturbing. On the night of November 3, 1998, Maddie Clifton, an eight-year-old, went to Joshua Phillips' house to play baseball. Although Phillips knew he wasn't allowed to host friends while his parents were away, he agreed to let Maddie play. The game turned catastrophic when Phillips accidentally hit Maddie in the eye with a baseball, causing severe injuries. Fearing his father's reaction, 
who was an alcoholic and strict, Phillips panicked. He brought Maddie into his house trying to manage the situation, but his fear escalated. After realizing Maddie was still alive and heard her cries, Phillips attacked her again, slit her throat, and stabbed her multiple times with a Leatherman tool, eventually killing her. Phillips then used air fresheners to mask the decomposing smell of Maddie's body. After Maddie Clifton, eight, was murdered, 15-year-old Joshua Phillips was charged as an adult with first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, avoiding the death penalty due to his age. To this day, Joshua Phillips, now 40, remains incarcerated at Cross City Correctional Institution.